Thank you very much, Amel, for that amazing introduction. Uh, thanks, uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks, Shimon, for inviting me to be part of this. It's, it's very exciting to present a research I've been working on over the past uh, two years. It's been quite a commitment. As, as Amel mentioned, a lot of the projects that we end up doing or, the, uh, or a lot of the projects that we end up working on really deals with Dubai as a city and the way we identify the city in the context of urban memory, in the context of scale, on, in the context of, of uh, space meaning. All of these things are constantly on the back of our mind. If some of you have been born and raised here, some of you have visited on and off, some of you are now residents of the city. Um, but within the city, there's, um, there's, there's, there are pockets of importance, and that really started uh, this form of investigation and ever since we launched the shelter which was an old uh, nail factory in Al Goz which is an industrial city trying to plan trying to find the old maps and trying to find the old archives was a bit of a, a challenge and that kind of opened my eyes to the old archives of the city and so two years um, two years of research really led me to look at all of these different master plans but what I identified most was a specific year in 1976. And 1976 was a very interesting year for the city of Dubai. And if you look at this map, this map was produced by USAID uh, in collaboration with the UNDP. And uh, it was dated, I think, May 1976. And it shows you a very interesting sort of urban terrain for the city. You can see where UC is written, it's, it's a title for under construction. So it seems like the whole city in 1976 was a massive construction site. A lot of development was occurring. You can see towers, really dredging of the, of the Khor, which is the creek, the development of a park, huge industrial areas. Al Goz was starting up with a cement plant. It was a very interesting time and it just kept on unfolding this, this period of 1976. In, in the back of my mind. And also in it, the setup of the Dubai, Dubai planning department in Dubai municipality, the town planning department, started in 75 but was really empowered in, in 1976. And you can see Kamal Hamza with a series of town planners. There was about 15 to 20 town planners, Japanese of background, some graduated from Penn State, really experts in the field of city planning and urbanism. And they were empowered in, in uh, in uh, 1976 with a budget of 600 million, which is a substantial amount of money, 20 times more than they've ever previously had to really embark on this planning measure of the city. So you can see like, the, the new town planning department with, with, with quite progressive interdepartmental uh, sections. You can see they have an archive, they've got a town planning studio, they've got a technical library, they've got all of this infrastructure. It might sound usual, to the audience, but this was really progressive in, in 76. And so they were really empowered with this budget and they were empowered with this sort of setup. And this really kind of shaped the planning measures of 76. Um, another major project in 1976 was the tallest tower in the Middle East. So this was under construction. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a very interesting type for, for or typology for, for the debate. And everybody, I think, knows the, it's called Sheikh Rashid uh, Tower, uh, Burj Rashid in, in Arabic. But it was a very interesting scale. So again, this, this interesting year of development that really took shape of the city. Another major development was Jebel Ali Port. Is everybody familiar with Jebel Ali? And this was, again, really huge dredging work planned for many years, but really broke ground in 76. Um, I'm going to take a second to explain this a bit further. Um, so, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, so in 76, you can see it was the largest harbor. You can see that kind of wrench-shaped uh, dredge. And that was the largest harbor in the world uh, at that year. You can see the whole peripheral city that they were developing. Um, in parallel to it, and the monorail that was going to connect the infrastructure. And again, this is all in 1976 for, for the city to be planning such a progressive, sort of technologically developed city and planning all of this mixed-use development around the port and really trying to connect what 
uh, what we saw earlier on, the development of, of the creek in parallel to Jabal Ali, uh, was these two peripheral towns that were meant to be really economic beacons or, or villages within the city. This is one of my favorite slides because in 1976 there was a, well it started in 74, there was a proposal for something called the Deira Sea Cornish competition. And they invited uh, Rahel and Rima Petela out of Finland to propose the first man-made island. And this was at the mouth of the creek and you can see uh, on the bottom right corner that's the entrance to the creek. And there was this bridge that would, that would connect you to this new floating mixed-use city that has a mosque and has all of these sort of mixed-use development. That is a floating uh, stadium over there on the bottom. Um, and all of these different towers. Um, it's a very, very interesting, very, very interesting proposal, very, very interesting time. The architects themselves are quite renowned. They've done a Sif Palace in, in, in Kuwait. They've worked on a project in, in India. There were, there were these progressive architects that were really looking, taking modernity to, to another level. I find this to be fascinating. And this model was, uh, was produced in 74, represented, reiterated until 76, and then finally was presented in the 1982 Venice Biennale, which was themed around Islamic architecture. So it was, it was, it was, quite, uh, it was quite a statement back then. This is a very also interesting approach in 76. This was a proposal for the redevelopment of the whole uh, Deira seafront. And so if you look at the top right development, that was a proposal to, to develop the whole Deira area. And the proposal was to uh, the report in 1976 by an architect called George Candilis, who I'll explain a little bit about, uh, proposed that 70% of the buildings in Deira were not fit for use or not fit for occupy. And so he presented a huge uh, proposal to demolish that part of the city. And, uh, uh, rebuild new new buildings and you can see how rigid the plan was and it comes from this ideology that K uh, George Candilis came from where he worked if you look at the bottom left picture this is George Candilis uh, with uh, Le Corbusier and uh, Pablo Picasso discussing uh, on site uh, for those that are familiar with uh, uh, Unité Habitation which is a large housing project proposed by Corbusier that got realized in places like Berlin as well and so George Candilis really took the lead in that development and once he left he set up his own office. And you can see him on the top left presenting to Sheikh Rashid bin Saeed and um, Saif al a housing typology again. And that again is a Deira Seafront uh, competition. And on the bottom, bottom part of that illustration you can see a tower called Dubai Tower again. Fascinating project, taller than, than, uh, than the existing proposed Sheikh Rashid Tower uh, with a floating opera house. Um, so it's it very interesting um, and so again it comes back to this uh, discussion where a lot of people uh, look at Dubai and say Dubai is a city that came out of the desert which there's a lot of truth to that but the reality of it when we when I went back and I started to explore these archives and I started to look at all of these different archives in particular the 70 in, in, in 76 looking at that specific year the whole city really took shape it was this form of a local port city, Amina, Akhor, uh, Abarat, uh, it was this whole language of trade, very, very small in, in scale, really connected with the world and all of this sort of connection of global architects, designers and ideologies and practices, really connected with the local, and, uh, with the local city. And so this picture is a very typical picture. I think a lot of people relate to it. There's another one that's kind of hue and color, but it's basically showing uh, a, 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 the Jumeirah side on the left and then the downtown Dubai side which is still not existing. And people say, wow, Dubai came out of the desert and this was a picture really contrasted with Sheikh Zayed Road. But the reality of it is this picture was taken from that tower. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the tallest tower in the Middle East. So it really contrasts with this ideology of, wow, Dubai comes from this, but it's taken from the tallest tower. And if you look on the... If you look in the horizon, you can see a completely built up city. So the, whoever took that picture, if you just turned around and took a picture on the <laughs> other side, you would have seen a completely built city. Given, I mean, obviously, that they've managed to build the whole of Sheikh Zayed Road in two decades is spectacular. But the reality of it, there was a completely built up city on the other side. 
And there are more pictures of this other side. So you can see a kindergarten school by Ja'far Toqan and George Reyes that was developed here on the bottom. This was a kindergarten typology. Beautiful, progressive, uh, modern ideology of how architecture can be translated with a wind tower. On the top left was, a, was an architect called Bullard from Vienna. He did the clock tower as a landmark. That was uh, the old souks and the bazaars in between those buildings and the post office, which is one of my favorite buildings, uh, no longer existing, unfortunately. Again, just to show you one more, one more, uh, one more uh, uh, project, which is the Dubai Airport. Again, a very special project. Um, again, built in, this was built even before uh, 76. This was built in 71. And you can see the, the beautiful type of architecture. It's one of my favorites. It still exists, but it's overshadowed by huge other A380 airports. So. Uh, but I, I really also, uh, th th I, I think uh, it's important to not only look at 76 in Dubai, as, as I was saying, it was connecting to the global and the local. It's very important to look at 76 on a global scale. So to give, to give 76 some context in, in this type of uh, development. So this is what was happening globally. This is, these are the type of, of issues that were being faced in the West and, and the East. So... Really, for those that are familiar with the Bretton Woods Accord, which is the, the, it's basically how currencies were produced in, in this, in, uh, through gold bullions. And so currencies were presented through reserves of gold. And that form of collapse started to happen. And there were promissory notes. And that began the world of bonds and debts and all of this relationship to these forms of promises. So when we take a few steps back earlier on when I mentioned that Dubai presented a budget of 600 million. A decade later, it presented a budget of 400 billion for its development. So these promises were made on the whim that of a form of debt, so this form of debt infrastructure relationship. And, and that was, uh, the Bretton Woods Accord played an important ra role in, in that sort of uh, uh, expediency in that kind of development. Another one, uh, another situation was the dem demolition of the Pruitt Igo. And in, uh, and in 1976, the last brick and the last building was demolished. And Pruitt Igo is a, is, a, is a housing development for a social housing development in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. It was designed by Yamazaki, who is an American Japanese architect well known and uh, basically it was really unpopular. So all of these modernist architects that were trying to reshape a complete city all of a sudden found themselves unpopular during 76 and post 76. Um, so it really shows the, uh, a different type of language. And the last one, uh, which is the establishment of Habitat. And Habitat is, uh, is, uh, is an association of uh, human settlements due to rapid urbanization. And this was the first poster and issue of the magazine that promoted the, the conference. And you can see sort of local housing typologies such as igloos or, or teepees looking at the development, sort of iterated development and housing situation uh, in that. So these, this is very interesting looking at the tension between the way Dubai developed in 76 and the way it kept on evolving versus what was happening globally and this form of tension. Unfortunately, the presentation is really open-ended and, and inconclusive for, for us to have a discussion. It's more of me presenting a specific finding that I found interesting, and I hope you guys also found it interesting. But I'd like to have a conversation about what you guys saw and, and whether it's interesting or not. And, and so looking 40 years on, maybe that, that's the first question we can pose. What has changed? What seems different? How do you guys feel about what I presented? How much time do we have left? 16. OK, great. Um, ah, there's already a question over there, so we'll take that. Hi. Hello, friend. Hello. <laughs> that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we've been here an awful long time, um, as you know. And in that time, you've worked on some incredible projects that have been very close to us as a family as we've grown here that unfortunately have not lasted the test of time that's sort of broken a lot of hearts when they've closed. One of the most recent disasters, in my opinion, and for us as a family, was Safa Park demolition 
which also included Archive 1. We know that there are plans for Archive 2, but is there anything else in the pipeline that we can get excited about in the future that go down more of the route of bringing the community together again in the way that Safa Park Archive really, really did and, uh, and obviously made an awful lot of people in this city incredibly, incredibly happy? Well, I mean, we're, I personally... It's one of my favorite pro projects, the, uh, the Archive, but again, the project isn't... In my opinion, it's very special. It brought the community together, but it's actually Safa Park that's, it, it feels more sad to, to lose that park. But hopefully a, a large portion of it will, will remain. And, and we've got a new project coming up, uh, which, is, which is Archive 2 in Khazan Park, which I find to be a very special and exciting project, especially that it's, it's in a park that houses the water tower designed by Dariush, and you have the Dubai Petroleum Building. So that's, that's something that, that I think should be exciting. Maybe uh, before uh, uh, Murtaza gets to ask a question, your, I know it was an extremely uh, brief and, in a sense, uh, condensed series of highlights of a much larger body of, of, of research, but it, in, a way it, in, a, in a way it focused on, on those kind of global, uh, you know, the superstars of, of global history um, and of course it's deep you know it's incredibly interesting to I, I guess to, to discover as you say I think one of the one of the kind of cliches one of the stereotypes which is often I mean it's said in many many ways but one way is often just very derisively which is to suggest there was nothing and then you know and then we got brilliant people from abroad to come and, and then we got, you know, and then there was something, right? And, and that's quite, uh, you know, we know the nature, the source of that narrative. But I think, I mean, uh, we've, we've hosted some sessions here over the years, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, which have also kind of unpicked that binary uh, definition, right? Of, uh, of, uh, of a kind of, liter of a sort of de a desert of local knowledge versus the imported oasis of the great foreign knowledge. And you mentioned Karen Hamza, for example, who, uh, may, maybe you could say something, I, it would be just great to hear about some of the, the, ca the characters uh, that were already here and who were instrumental um, in, in their, in, through, by what they did themselves, um, as well as bringing, let's say, some of these, uh, these iconic people here. Yeah, one of the, Part of going out and collecting this type of data, I had the chance to meet some wonderful planners, urbanists, architects that have really shaped the city. And uh, so when I go back to the town planning department, mm. it, was, uh, it was a department full of these super, uh, superstars that came from uh, established backgrounds, two Japanese individuals, somebody that used to work in uh, who worked closely at uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, uh, Tallahassee practice. Um, you had a series of people that came from Penn State. They knew what they were doing, but this sort of clash with, uh, I think also with the, all of these very established architects that came with heavy I ideals to try to implement, they were contrasted with a lot of local engineered staff. And, and that comes into contrast with the terms like, if you look at the term muhandis and ma'mari, like these terms and muhandis is, is a term that's used for architects as well. But in reality, what it means is engineer. So there's the, even the definition of what an architect or urbanist or engineer, th there's a kind of a gray area. So even the setup of the town planning department was dominant by engineers. And it's evident, it seems like a lot of the developments were infrastructural. There was very little uh, socio-spatial uh, ideals really embedded within the planning measures during that time. But I, I sat with a, a gentleman called Umi Bayashi, who again is Japanese, spent 10 years in the Dubai planning department. And he was telling me all of these beautiful stories about um, a school that was demolished and a lot of the local community really uh, were, felt really emotional about the whole situation. And then he felt uh, to take it upon himself to build a monument 
And then, so he went out there and requested the budget and tried to pay, pay tribute to the school. And so you've got all of these interesting nuances, but also this clash of this Japanese guy going to somebody like Hamal Hamza and asking him for a budget for a monument. And he's like, what are you doing? You need to concentrate on building this bridge. And so it's a very, it was a very testing time for, all, for everybody, but also the rapid pace of development. Again, I find it to be, it's very important when things change to be intergenerational. We go to, there's a sense of comfort when I go to Hatta or when I go to Khwanij and I go to these peripheral areas that, that are part of Dubai that haven't changed. There's forms of urban memories that you've constructed through your childhood or through friends. And those are important things. So um, it was a very tense time, this sort of moving forward yet paying homage to the past. Yet, how do we construct, how do we preserve heritage? Yet these buildings are being demolished. Yet, so there was this ongoing tension that I kept on hearing over and over again. Um, Murtaza, do you still have a question? Can we get a mic over there, Lujan, please? Um, actually, my question was exactly what uh, Rashid just said, which was that how do we take this kind of collecting of information and operationalize it so that uh, all of these buildings that are modernist buildings that we remember from growing up here, how they don't all become uh, just either plans or photographs. Uh, like how, how do we turn this into some sort, some sort of like a, an architectural preservation movement almost in, in the face of this kind of profound urban expansion and transformation? To be fair, I feel, I feel uh, I'm always inspired by Sheikh Ahur, to be honest, and, and the, the project that, that, that she's done with the, with the uh, UFO flying, flying saucer, saucer. <laughs> uh, the flying saucer, and it's very inspiring to see that. And I mean, 10 years ago, we've been trying to look at one building at a time and try to present our case, to try to gather funding from gov governmental institutions, to try to restore a building. But the reality of it is, the math or the financial model doesn't make sense to them. So I think individuals, as much as we tend to rely on the public sector or, or government institutions, it's, they play a very important role, but at some point you just have to take it upon yourself to play an important role. And seeing how these old buildings can be adapted and reused with new civic uses, or public or private or whatever it is, and they're beautiful interventions. There are, there are so many different parts of the city. So what I would recommend is, let's not get stuck into this sort of commercial habit of looking for a specific space that we can monetize out of because that is a market condition. We can shape it. I mean, we've seen it in, in global places and the subject of gentrification is a highly debated subject, but I, I still feel like just the nature of turnover within the city allows us to look at other spaces and without having such damage as places in, in Europe. So we can create new life for spaces that already have a natural turnover for a population. So, I mean, just to follow up on that, I mean, I, th I feel like uh, you already achieved that to some degree with the archive. And then even that transformation didn't stick. So uh, while I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying, I feel like to some degree there has to be uh, like a, an intervention at the level of the public sector like a, some sort of a historic preservation department. I don't know whether one exists. I guess my question is, does one exist? I can't chain myself to a tree in Suffolk Park. You know? <laughs> so that's just to a building. <laughs> not a building. <laughs> so, no, but the reality of it is I feel like you just need to take one project at a time. I mean, fine, the archive was a beautiful experience for three years. There was a, it wasn't rocket science what we've done. We've just found an existing building in a beautiful park. The trees were there. There was nothing that we've done that's complex. We just reused it. There are beautiful different parts of the city. Karama, Satwa, Jabal Ali, Khwani. There, there are buildings that exist that have this form of urban memory. So just somebody needs to go out there and try to be proactive. One doesn't work because of a project that is of large scale, that's an infrastructure project, we move on, we find the next building, we make the best of it. But in your research, have you discovered, is there any even uh, desire or impetus to uh, develop a historic preservation department within the bio I mean, the rules are there, planning, the planning? rules are there, they exist. So. The <laughs> the just, to, just to conclude, the rules are there. Any building that's 40 years old, you can declare, go to Rashad Bukhash, have a conversation, try to preserve it. 
the rules are there. You can't do it. It's about enforcement. Are there some other questions? Ah, oh, yes. Um, ironically, um, I'm in the middle of a uh, commission with the um, Alaskan uh, Heritage Council doing a uh, augmented reality um, novella, um, basically on 2179 Anchorage and uh, Dubai called The Archive, and I've just stumbled into this whole thing. But the thing is, is what I'm wondering about is, is this whole global art form has been so interesting to me because I've been in dialogue with people with Bruce Sterling and that sort of thing in regards to near future dialogues. And what I'm wondering here is that I'm wondering about whether the idea of science fiction as such is as valid as something as near future speculation, you know, in, in regards to reflecting upon the future that was, the future that's being and where we're going as, as, as a species, you know, whether science fiction is as valid as, as new fear, near future speculation in regards to the fact that being that I've been a resident of the UAE for only nine months now, and I'm surprised at basically how the future is always constantly here. I'm just kind of wondering whether we're now in a place where science fiction has ceased to be because we're now living in it day to day, and now whether we're just in a matter of a dialogue of near future speculation. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. That's that. That's the usual kind I of my question. That, um, I think that throughout the many panels over the last three days, people have started to think about that and touched on that as well. But also thinking about what we can do collectively to rethink other futures. Because I think it was Hito, I, I, I can't get, um, get all of those aphorisms that came out of her, <laughs> came out of her mouth that day out, out of my head, but she was saying things about these, this idea of the future already being here and this, uh, maybe this like techno-optimist um, attitude as, as somehow being dangerous and for us to get caught up in a cycle and that there is still the possibility to imagine, yeah, I, imagine I'll, more. I'll just say that I think that Dubai has destroyed science fiction. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much, Rashid. I just really wanted to say it was it was amazing to have you here and to to hear you talk about Dubai, um, talk about a specific date, and have you open up globally. Um, and before we close the session, I just wanted to ask a little bit about that date, that year, um, to ask a little bit more about that, and to also maybe connect it regionally because you were speaking about this I modernist really project a modernist project in Dubai but uh, but like thinking about Kuwait for example and all of the projects that were happening there what were the link ups if there were any and also maybe a little bit of the political background what was happening that that was a very important decade in the gulf and maybe just a few words on that before we close sure. Sure. Few words, on a few words exactly. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <in> <laughs> <dissertation>. <laughs> 60 seconds. I think just quickly, I think an important date would be 71. Try to create the unification of the UAE and then 72 and Ras al Khaimah and, and then 73 as well. So you look at that whole negotiation that started, I think it started in 68, trying to get Bahrain and Qatar to create this whole nine emirates. That was the original plan. And Kuwait was there very much supportive. Kuwait was on a different world. It's, it's, uncompar it's not comparable to anything in the Gulf. They were way ahead of their time. Uh, the, at, at, in the 70s, they were doing charity work in Dubai. They were setting up hospitals and schools. And they were doing the same thing in places like Qatar and, and Yemen. And it was a totally different era. So I find it very difficult to compare Kuwait to Dubai, but I feel like in, if there's any comparison, it would be the architects that practiced there ended up practicing here, just because of the close links. Uh, same thing with Bahrain and, and Qatar. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, they, they all traded in the same way. It was the same discipline. The architects shopped around for the same designs, small changes. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we all went through the same thing. While the world was shifting into a different trajectory, we were on a different level. So it was really this decoupling of what they were doing to what we were doing in this former shop around there. Super. We have run out of time. Will you please join us in thanking Rashid bin Shabib. Thank you so much.